Justinian has been crowned Emperor of Rome. He was a man that was steeped in the classics and understood Roman history. He was raised on stories of the heroes of old. Scipio, the man who defeated Rome's greatest enemy. Augustus, the first emperor, the man who ushered in the golden age of Rome. Constantine the Great, the first emperor to embrace Christianity. Rome, although strong, was a fraction of the size of the empire under Augustus, and Justinian could not abide the abomination of a Roman empire that didn't include the city of Rome. An ambition as large as reuniting the entire empire did not come cheap. This had to be paid for somehow. Both of his predecessors were penny pinchers that left the treasury overflowing with gold. But Justinian had already proven that he was a liberal spender. During one of his consulships, he had spent more than 37 pounds of gold just for the decorations of the games he threw. By the second year of his reign, he had already initiated a monumental building program that included no fewer than eight magnificent churches. Justinian was a man of remarkable vision and energy, but his greatest asset may have been finding other talented people and recruiting them to work on his behalf. To pay for the staggering expenses he would accrue, he found a man named John the Cappadocian, who seemed capable of squeezing money out of stone. Although he was uneducated and lacked any sort of social grace, Justinian knew this was his man. John streamlined the tax system, closed loopholes, and attacked official corruption with tenacity. He especially enjoyed targeting the rich, who had long escaped their due with exemptions and privileges, and he wasn't above torturing those he thought were holding out on him. This provoked a noble outcry, but Justinian was unsympathetic. In fact, Justinian had never thought very highly of the Roman aristocracy. He believed that they were greedy and small-minded, too stuck in their ways. But this indifference would come back to haunt him. After reforming the tax system, Justinian moved on to his next project, reforming the legal code. Roman law was a confusing mess of nearly a thousand years of often contradictory precedent, exemptions, and conflicting interpretations, none of which was written down in any one place. Fortunately for Justinian, he had met an extraordinary lawyer named Tribonian, who seemed to be a walking encyclopedia of Roman law. Tribonian took up the task with fervor. In merely 14 months, he published the new code, now known as the Corpus Juris Civilis, the basis for most European civil law to this day. The work consisted of three parts. The first was the Codex. This was a compilation, grouped by selection and extraction, of imperial enactments going all the way back to the time of Hadrian in the second century. The second was called the Digest, which was an encyclopedia composed of mostly brief extracts of Roman jurists. Fragments were taken out of various legal treatises and opinions and inserted in the Digest as a relatively simple way to access various laws and precedents. The last part was called the Institutes, which was primarily used as a textbook for aspiring law students. Law schools sprang up from Alexandria to Beirut, and the University of Constantinople soon produced legal scholars who exported the code throughout the Mediterranean world. Justinian then turned his considerable talents to foreign policy. The empire looked outward, brimming with confidence. Foreign emissaries flocked to the capital. The glittering new power and prestige drew neighboring powers into Byzantine orbit, and one diplomatic triumph seemed to be followed by another. To the west of the empire was the Ostrogothic kingdom situated in Italy. The Ostrogoths had maintained friendly relations with Constantinople as long as Theodoric the Great was alive. After his death, he was succeeded by his 10-year-old grandson and relations became more complicated. In North Africa, the Vandals were the preeminent power. Their relationship with the empire was more troubled. It was they that sacked the city of Rome in 455, and it was also the Vandals that defeated a large invading Roman army in the year 468. Relations with Rome normalized after the death of their first king, Gaiseric, but by Justinian's time, they had become unstable. The long arm of Justinian's ambition even reached as far south as Yemen, where the Jewish king had recently massacred his Christian subjects 
by throwing them into a ditch and setting them on fire. Justinian induced the Christian king of Ethiopia to retaliate and avenge the disaster by offering transport ships to aid in the crossing of the Red Sea. Within two years, a Christian king was installed on the Yemenite throne, and Rome was given access to trade routes from the Red Sea to India. By far the largest threat to Rome was their traditional rival of Persia. This was the case in the age of Julius Caesar 600 years previous, and it was still true in Justinian's time. The current king of kings of the Persian Empire was named Kavad, who was a very formidable figure in his own right, but was king of an empire that was unstable and not nearly as populous as Rome. The Persians had been in decline for some time, and their client kings, tired of Persian oppression, began to transfer their allegiance to Constantinople despite the protestations of Kavad. He decided to send an army into modern Georgia to prevent any more vassals from defecting. This ham-fisted measure forced Justinian to send a Roman army to raid Persian Armenia. The first force he sent wasn't especially large. It was only notable for a single man that Justinian contributed from his household guard. At the time, he was simply an unknown soldier, but he would soon show himself to be one of the most brilliant generals in imperial history. Like Justinian himself, his origins were humble, but kings and generals would one day tremble at the name of Belisarius. In the next video, we will discuss the First Persian War and why Belisarius is held in such high regard. Stay tuned.